Hey there everyone, today we're going to be taking a quick look at Warcry and the basics of how to play. Now, Warcry is a miniature skirmish game, meaning the gameplay is quick, the model count is low, and it's really, really easy to get into. Another bonus is that a warband can be the starting point of an AOS army for Age of Sigma. And likewise, you can quickly form a warband straight out of your existing Age of Sigma collection. Warcry is a game that's really exciting and easy to pick up. So, let's just dive straight in. Now, each game of Warcry is unique and randomly generated by these four decks of cards. The Terrain deck, Deployment deck, the Victory deck, and the Twist deck. Now, flipping one card from each will generate a unique scenario. We've already randomly generated a scenario with the following cards. So let's take a look. We've got Terrain, which we've set up already. The Deployment, which we've also already set up. The Victory Condition, as well as the Twist. Now, using these four, we can get an almost infinite number of combinations and scenarios. So, with those in mind, let's take a look at how to actually play through a round of Warcry. Now, you'll be playing as the Untamed Beast, and I'll be playing as the Iron Golems. One round of Warcry only has three phases. The Hero Phase, the Reserve Phase, and the Combat Phase. Now, let's start with the Hero Phase. Here, each player rolls six dice. Now, these dice will be for you, playing the Untamed Beast. Let's go! Cool! Now, I'll be playing the Iron Golems. I'll be rolling these six dice for the Iron Golems. Alright, cool. Let's take a look. Now, first off, we take note of any doubles, triples, or quads, and note them down. These are called ability dice, and they're going to be pretty useful later on to help us play abilities. The rest, which are singles, are called initiative dice. This helps us determine who has the initiative, uh, i.e. who gets to activate their fighter class in the combat phase. The player with more initiative dice has the initiative. You've got four, and I've got none. So you have the initiative. Now that's not all. Each round, each player gets a wild dice. You can use this wild dice to either add one to the singles to try and you know snatch the initiative, or to turn a double into a triple or triple into a quad. Now if a player chooses not to use the wild dice, they can keep it to use in a turn later. Now second is the reserve phase. We won't go into detail on this, but during this phase, uh, it's when your reserves enter the fray. And thirdly, comes the most exciting part, the combat phase. Now, starting with the player with the initiative, the players take turns activating fighters from their warband. During a fighter's activation, you can take two actions from the following list. Move, attack, disengage, or wait. We'll go into these in detail in a little bit. So, in addition to the two actions during their activation, a fighter can activate an ability. Remember those doubles, triples, and quads we rolled earlier? Yep, we're going to use those to pay for our abilities. So, now let's go through a fighter's activation. Since you have the initiative, you will go first. Let's say you choose to activate the first fang, this guy over here. Let's try to move him and attempt an attack. He can move 4 inches as shown here. Let's move him 4 inches. Now, his move can include horizontal as well as vertical movement, but generally he can't end his activation while he's climbing up an obstacle. Otherwise, he will fall to the ground and possibly take some damage. Let's move him 4 inches over here, so he'll be closer to be able to see one of the enemy fighters. Right, he's in line of sight. So after he moves, let's try to make an attack action with him. To make an attack action, you have to pick a weapon to attack with. Let's use his harpoon over here. We have to choose a target within 8 inches. So let's choose the signifer as a target. You see within 8 inches? Yep, just nice, 8 inches. So let's try the attack. Let's roll to hit. We roll a number of dice equal to the attack characteristic of the weapon over here, which is 2. So let's roll 2 dice. Pretty good. To see what's the number we need to roll for a successful hit, let's compare the strength of the weapon over here with the toughness of the target, which is over here. Now that's a 4 versus a 4. Looking at this table over here, we see that we hit on a 4 or a 5. Also, we score a critical hit on a 6. Looking at the damage characteristics of the harpoon, it shows how much damage a regular hit causes, as well as how much damage a critical hit causes. It's 2 for a regular hit, and 5 for a critical hit. It seems we've done 7 damage to the signifer with this attack. 
Now, we can try to use an ability as well during this activation. So, let's take a look at the ability card for the Untamed Beast. In order to use the ability, our fighter during his activation needs to have all the necessary rulemouths or symbols. Now, this Harpoon Snag requires the Untamed Beast rulemouth as well as the Brute rulemouth, both of which our first tank had. And lucky for us, he did roll a double that we upgraded into a triple earlier. So, we are able to use this ability now. But now, we'll cash in those triple dice in order to do a Harpoon Snag. Now, the Harpoon Snag ability says the fighter can make a bonus attack action. A bonus action doesn't count towards the actions that a fighter can normally make during his activation. So it's basically, you know, it's free. So we'll make a bonus attack action. Let's roll dice equal to the attack characteristic, which is a 2. Successfully hitting on a 4 or higher. Oh no, we didn't really do much. But looking at the harpoon snake description, we also force the signifer to move directly towards our first fang, a distance equal to the value of the ability. So just now we cash in at triple six, so we will move the signifer six inches closer. Shoot. So we've seen how to do moves and attacks. Now the other two actions are disengage and wait. Now before we talk about disengage, we need to go through a few minor rules that we glossed over earlier. Basically, if your fighter is within one inch of an enemy fighter, you can only make a move that brings it closer to the enemy fighter or the same distance as it was before. Also, when it attacks, you can only target an enemy fighter that's within one inch. Now, knowing this, you might think that it's not always beneficial to be within such close range of enemy fighters. And that's what a disengage action does. It allows you to reposition your fighter up to three inches horizontally away. Now, take note that this does not count as a move action, so your fighter can't move vertical distances like climbing during a disengage action. Now, the last possible action we can take is to just wait. If wait is the second action you take for that activation, you simply end the fighter's activation. However, if wait is your first action, what it does is it lets your fighter wait to be activated again later in the same combat phase. Now this is useful in some ways, sometimes you want your opponent to make the first move, but also this allows the same fighter to activate an ability once, and then a second time in its second activation for the turn. And that ladies and gentlemen is basically the basics of Warcry. Now, there are loads of different warbands for you to pick from, each with the different playstyles and abilities, and a huge variety of possible scenarios to play through with the four decks. So, grab a copy of your favorite warband, a card pack for existing models that you might already have, or an entirely new core set like Warcry Catacombs, and we'll see you in store. So, this is Gerard, signing off for now.